In this video, we're going to be talking about Euler's method, which is a numerical method that we can use to approximate the solution to a differential equation. So what exactly does that mean? Well, just like it sounds, it's a method that we can use to approximate or estimate a solution to a differential equation, and in particular, a differential equation initial value problem. So what does that imply about when we use Euler's method? Well, it implies that we use it when we can't find an exact solution. After all, if we're using Euler's method to find an approximate solution, and certainly an approximate solution wouldn't be as desirable as an exact solution, then using Euler's method kind of implies that we can't use another method to find an exact solution. So up to this point, we've talked about differential equations for which we could easily find an exact solution. So differential equations like separable differential equations, exact differential equations, or linear differential equations. Those are all examples of very specific types of differential equations that come in a particular form where we can use a specific method to find the exact solution. The interesting thing is that the way we study differential equations makes us think that most differential equations come in one of these forms. They're almost all separable differential equations, exact differential equations, or linear differential equations. When in fact, exactly the opposite is true. Very few differential equations fit one of these exact formats, separable, exact, or linear. Most differential equations don't fit any of these formats at all and can't be solved using the methods that we would normally use to solve these kinds of differential equations. So if we're given a differential equation and it's not separable, it's not in the form of an exact differential equation, and it's not in the form of a linear differential equation, then how do we go about finding a solution to that particular differential equation? Well, that's where a numerical method can come in and help us find an approximate solution or an estimate of the exact solution. And Euler's method is the easiest, most popular numerical method to use to find an approximation for the solution to the differential equation. Now later on we're going to talk about how Euler's method actually works, the fundamentals behind it, and sort of the intuition of it. But right now I want to just walk you through an example of how to use Euler's method so that you know how to apply it when you run into an Euler's method problem. So for problems where you're going to use Euler's method, you're going to be given something like this. So you're given the differential equation y prime is equal to 2 plus y, and you can think about y prime as dy over dt. Now normally with calculus problems, you have the dependent variable y and the independent variable x. Conventionally, typically, for an Euler's method problem, your independent variable will be t instead of x. So you're going to get used to seeing t and y as opposed to x and y, and you see that here in this f of t sub 0, y sub 0, you have t and y instead of x and y, which means you can think about y prime being the same thing as dy divided by dt, where y prime is 2 plus y. You're given the initial condition y of 0 equals 0, so this is an initial value problem. You're told that n equals 3, we'll talk about what that means in a second, and then you're asked to find the value y of 3. And this is the formula that you're going to use when you apply Euler's method. This is the Euler's method formula. The interesting thing about this formula is that it's going to change each time you apply it. So you'll apply it multiple times in succession, and you're always going to be using your previous answer to come up with the next approximation. So you'll find the first value, then you'll use that value to find the next one, then you'll use that last value to find the next one, and you'll continue on until you get to the last point, the point that you're asked to solve for. And that makes a little bit of sense because you'll notice here that this is a formula for y sub 1. And as part of the formula for y sub 1, we're using the value y sub 0, which of course is the previous value. If you think about these values in a sequence, you'd first have the value y sub 0, then y sub 1, then y sub 2, y sub 3, etc. in a sequence like that y sub 0 is therefore the term before or the previous term compared to y sub 1. And so this formula for y sub 1 is using the previous term or the term before it, y sub 0. And the reason this formula is going to change is because we're going to apply it once to get y sub 1. 
But then when we apply it again, we'll be looking for the value y sub 2. So this will change here to y sub 2. And then over here on the right hand side, we'll be using y sub 1. So everything is always going to bump up by 1. Here we have 0, y sub 0, t sub 0, y sub 0 on the right hand side to find y sub 1 on the left. When we want to find y sub 2 on the left, we'll have y sub 1, t sub 1, y sub 1. When we want to find y sub 3 on the left, we'll have y sub 2, t sub 2, y sub 2 on the right. So these values here on the right are always going to be one less than the value on the left. So let's start to break down each piece of this formula individually, starting with delta t. So think of delta t as your step size or the change in the independent variable t each time you use Euler's method to come up with an approximation. The way that you're going to want to find delta t is to use the information you've been given n equals 3 here and then these two initial conditions. So keep in mind that for the initial conditions here we have y of 0 equals 0. Well with this initial condition this value here of 0 we can always think of as t sub 0. No matter what the value is in here it's always going to be t sub 0. And then over here on the right this is y sub 0. Now we've been asked to use n equals 3 and what that tells us right away is that the last value that we want to find for t will be t sub 3. So we're always going to start with t sub 0 and because n equals 3 we want to end with t sub 3. If n were equal to 5 we would want to end with t sub 5. So our last value needs to be t sub 3 and because we've been asked to find y of 3 and this is always a y of t expression. We know our last value is t sub 3. That means that 3 has to be t sub 3 or our last value of t. What that means then is that when we want to find delta t, we take our last value for t, which in this case is 3. We subtract our first value for t, which in this case is 0. And then we divide that by the value we've been given for n, which is 3 in this case. So 3 minus 0 is 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. So for this problem, delta t is equal to 1. So that's how you find delta t, and you always want to do that first. Once you have that value for delta t, now you always want to begin setting up a chart. And so here's what your chart looks like. You're always going to have a value here for t, and then a value here for y. We always want to start with t sub 0, and we know for this problem that t sub 0 equals 0. Now because we've been told that delta t is equal to 1, we want to add 1 to t sub 0 equals 0 over and over again until we get to this last value of t, which we already know is 3. So delta t is 1, we want to start adding 1. And so we get t sub 1 is equal to 1, we get t sub 2 is equal to 2, we get t sub 3 is equal to 3, and now because we got to the value 3 and we're looking here for y of 3 where t is equal to 3, we stop at that point. Now one important thing to note, in this particular problem you see that t sub 0 equals 0, these two numbers happen to match, the 0 and the 0. Here we have 1 and 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3. That's just a coincidence about this problem. That will not always be the case. What will always be the case is that you start with t sub 0 for this first value and you plug in whatever you have here inside your initial condition. So in this case, that was 0. And then you find your value for delta t, in this case 1, and you keep adding to this right hand side. 0 plus 1 gives 1, 1 plus 1 gives 2. You keep going until this last number here on the right hand side is equal to your final value for t which you grab out of the question here. So once you get that left hand side of your table set up, now you move to the right hand side where you're dealing with the corresponding values for y. You're always going to have here y sub 0 to match t sub 0. Now remember, based on the problem, we've already been told that y sub 0 is equal to 0, so we can go ahead and put that into our chart right away. But we're also going to need values for y sub 1, for y sub 2, 
and for y sub 3. Now this is where the Euler's method formula comes into play. So we have the formula here for y sub 1, and the reason that we write the formula for y sub 1 is because we're always already given the value for y sub 0. So we don't need a formula for y sub 0, we already have it. The first time we're going to need the formula is to find y sub 1. Let's go through this in order. We know that y sub 1 is equal to, first of all, y sub 0, which we already have. We know that that's 0. Now this plus f of t sub 0, y sub 0. Well, remember, we already have the values for t sub 0 and y sub 0. They come from the initial condition right here, and we know that they are both equal to 0. So this is like saying the function f evaluated at the coordinate point 0, 0. So what is the function f? Well, the function f is always the right-hand side of the differential equation we were given. So this is f, and that's where we get this f value coming from. So when we say f of 0, 0, the coordinate point 0, 0 given by t sub 0, y sub 0, we want to take the coordinate point 0, 0 and plug it into 2 plus y. Well, if we do that, we're going to be plugging in 0 for y, and we'll get 2 plus 0, or just 2. So f evaluated at t sub 0, y sub 0, is just 2. So we say here plus 2, and then we multiply that by delta t, which in this case we know is 1. So this comes out to 2 times 1 is 2. Now here's where things start to get a little trickier. We need to find y sub 2, and in order to do that, let's go ahead and adapt the Euler's method formula. So this right here needs to change, this needs to change, and then right here, these values need to change as well. So this time, remember we bump everything up by 1. So before we had 1 on the left and all zeros on the right, which means we need 2 on the left and all 1s on the right. So 2, 1, 1, and 1. And let's go through this piece by piece again. So now y sub 2 is equal to y sub 1. And there's our first real look at using the previous value to find y sub 2. So we're trying to find y sub 2. We have to use the previous value y sub 1. That's the value we just found. We said that y sub 1 was equal to 2. We now have to use this value to find y sub 2. So you'll notice that you can't move on to the next approximation until you have the previous one. So you have to find y sub 1 before you can find y sub 2, and you have to find y sub 2 before you can find y sub 3. So this is kind of like one step at a time. You have to take one step before you can take the next. So to find y sub 2, that's equal to y sub 1, which we know is 2, plus f of t sub 1, y sub 1. Well, t sub 1 we have right here. That's equal to 1. And y sub 1, we have right here. That's 2. So we're evaluating f at the coordinate point 1, 2. Well, if we plug in here to 2 plus y, the only value we're interested in is that y value, which is 2 in this case for y sub 1. So we get 2 plus 2, or 4, when we plug in here for f, multiplied by delta t, which is still 1. So that's going to be equal to 2 plus 4, or 6. Now to find y sub 3, let's see if we can do it without changing the Euler's method formula. We know based on the formula that we always want to use the previous value of y, which in this case is 6, plus f of the previous coordinate point, in this case t sub 2, y sub 2, or 2, 6. When we plug the coordinate point 2, 6 into 2 plus y, we get 2 plus the y value, 2 plus 6, or 8. So we get 8 there, and delta t is always 1. So we get 6 plus 8, or 14. And now we've basically finished our problem. We were asked to find the value y of 3. Well, that means that we were asked to find the value of y when t was equal to 3. Well, based on our table here, t is equal to 3 here in this last row of the table. We had t sub 3 is equal to 3. This is where t is equal to 3. And according to our table, the corresponding value for y is 14. So when this problem asks us find y of 3, we can say that y of 3 is equal to 14 
And that's the answer to the Euler's method problem. Now, a couple things to note about this process. This problem was fairly simple, and the values that we had to plug in for t and y over here on the right-hand side were pretty straightforward. A lot of times, though, you're going to have a more complicated value. So maybe when we find y sub 1, let's pretend this is a different example. When we find y sub 1, we end up with, we, we plug into our calculator for whatever our function is, and we end up with 2.364521. Let's say. And then we want to go on and find the next value, y sub 2. This is an extremely important point about Euler's method. So you're taking successive approximations. So when I find y sub 2, I'm using the value from y sub 1. When I find y sub 3, I'm using the value from y sub 2. For that reason, it's really, really important that you keep, if you have a, a decimal here for y sub 1, that you keep as many decimal places as you possibly can and use this exact value to find y sub 2, as opposed to rounding your answer to the nearest tenth or hundredth. So instead of maybe rounding this to 2.36 and saying, oh, that's good enough, and plugging 2.36 in right here, 2.36, I want to make sure I plug in 2.3645 to one to get my next approximation. And then that I also keep this entire decimal to plug in to try to find y sub three. Because if you start rounding at each step, the more you round and the more steps that you take, the less accurate your final answer will be. So it's really important that you keep as many decimal places as you possibly can and keep these values as accurate as you possibly can as you're going through the Euler's method process. There's one other thing to note, and that's in relation to delta t here. So for most basic Euler's method problems that you're going to encounter, you're going to find that the value of delta t is constant. In other words, the step size is equal. In this case, we found that delta t was equal to 1, and so we sort of use a step size of 1 each time. We go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, and so the difference here is always equal. But sometimes you're going to be told to use an uneven step size, or maybe you'll be given the exact values that you should use for t. If that's the case, your process is still no different. You just map out the t values that you're supposed to use, and then to find your values for y, you always use the previous two values. So when you want to find y sub 1, you use t sub 0 and y sub 0. When you want to find y sub 2, you use t sub 1 and y sub 1. And you keep going on like that. So whether the step size is equal or unequal, this Euler's method process is still the same. So why does Euler's method actually work? Like what's the proof behind it? Why does it even make sense that we use this successive one step at a time method to approximate a solution to a differential equation? Well, the reason is because if we have a simple graph here, so we have this curve. Let's pretend that this curve models the solution y of t. So we were given this differential equation y prime, or dy over dt. And as you know, the solution to a differential equation, when you're given a differential equation for y prime, the solution is y of t, or just the equation for y. So let's pretend that this curve is the solution. And that curve has its starting point, its initial value, at the coordinate point t sub 0, y sub 0. So this curve, this is not related to the example we did before, but you get t sub 0, y sub 0 from the initial condition that you're given in your problem, whatever it is. In this case, it happens to be 0, 0. But the point is just that you have this initial condition, this point right here. And then you think about a tangent line that is tangent to that solution curve at the point t sub 0, y sub 0. Now, the reason that we draw the tangent line through that particular point as opposed to a different point is because we already have the information about this point. We know that that coordinate point, like in this problem, is 0, 0. So we could use that point of 0, 0 for our tangent line and get a tangent line equation. So that's why we draw the tangent intersecting there at that point. And now what we're asked to do in an Euler's method problem is approximate the value of the function along the solution curve, in this case here at t sub 1. 
So basically, we're trying to find this value right here. And we already know what t sub 1 is. In this case, it was t sub 3, and the value of t was 3. What we were trying to find, 14, was the value of the solution curve at that point. In other words, the y value. So if I come over here to the y-axis, to this point right here, in our case, down here would be 3. The value here would be 14. This is the y-axis and the t-axis, by the way. So I'm trying to find this value right here. In this problem before, it was 14. I'm trying to find that value of 14, the y value at that point along the solution curve. But of course, I don't know that it's 14. I only know the t value of 3. And I don't have a way, because I couldn't solve the differential equation, I couldn't find a solution to the differential equation because maybe it wasn't a separable, an exact, or a linear differential equation. Because I couldn't find the exact solution, I then instead go to my fallback method. I use Euler's method, a numerical method, to sketch a tangent line, and I say, well, maybe I can find the value here at this point instead, along the same value of t, and maybe that'll be a decent approximation of what the value is for the function itself. Now, this is a good time to mention that the more erratic your solution curve is, so the more violently it's moving up and down, the less accurate your tangent line approximation would be. Or on the flip side of that, if your solution curve happens to be relatively straight, almost linear, then when you draw the tangent line, the tangent line will be almost parallel. It'll be very close to that solution curve. And so it'll provide a good approximation of the actual value of the solution. But the faster your solution curve is changing, the more violently it's wobbling up and down or increasing or decreasing, the less accurate your tangent line approximation will be. Now we can prove to ourselves why Euler's method works if we just start with the point slope formula for the equation of a line. So we're going to use this point slope formula. You'll remember it. It's the change in y is equal to m multiplied by the change in x. This is the point slope formula for the equation of a line. And we could, of course, use this formula to find the equation of the tangent line. So what we want to show is that this Euler's method formula here is basically just the point slope formula in disguise. And we already know that the point slope formula can model the tangent line and that the tangent line can approximate the solution curve. So if we can show that these two formulas are essentially the same, then we know that this formula here would give us an approximation of the actual value of the solution. So the way that we change the point slope formula into the Euler's method formula is first by adding y sub 0 to both sides. So we get y sub 1 is equal to y sub 0 plus m times x1 minus x sub 0. Now, first of all, remember for Euler's method, we really do everything in terms of the independent variable t and the dependent variable y. We started with the point slope formula in terms of x and y. So let's just go ahead and change this into t so that it matches the format that we normally use for Euler's method. So we'll call the independent variable t. Now we recognize that t sub 1 minus t sub 0 is really just the change in t. So t sub 1 minus t sub 0, if we look at our graph here, we have t sub 1 and t sub 0. So we're saying the difference between this t value and this t value here, it's just the change in the value of t. So we can really call t sub 1 minus t sub 0 delta t. So we can rewrite this as y sub 1 equals y sub 0 plus m multiplied by delta t. Now remember, m is the slope of the tangent line. Well, how do we normally find the slope of a tangent line? Normally what we do is we take the derivative and then we evaluate that derivative at the point of tangency. Well, remember, in this Euler's method problem, we were given y prime equals 2 plus y. In other words, the derivative is equal to 2 plus y. So we were told this is the derivative, 2 plus y, is the derivative function. And we went ahead and called this f of 
ty. This right-hand side was f of ty, but really, because it's equal to y prime, it represents the derivative. And then we went ahead and evaluated that function f at t sub 0, y sub 0. Remember, this was t sub 0, y sub 0 originally when we were finding y sub 1. So really what we're saying is that we took the derivative function f and evaluated it at the point of tangency t sub 0, y sub 0. And when you take the derivative and then you evaluate the derivative at the point of tangency, that's going to give you the slope. So the slope m is really the same as this value up here. So we could replace that or we could rewrite it in a different way. m is really the same thing as f of t sub 0, y sub 0. And now what you notice is that this formula here is exactly the same as the Euler's method formula that we started with. Yes, we bumped up these values to y sub 2, y sub 1, t sub 1, but originally they were all 1 less. The formula looked exactly like this. It was this formula here. This is the Euler's method formula. So really all we're saying with Euler's method, when we use this formula to find each successive value of y, so we start with y sub 0, and then we use that to find y sub 1, and then use that to find y sub 2, and use that to find y sub 3 until we get to wherever we need to be. Really all we're doing is using this tangent line approximation to find an approximate value for our point along the solution curve y of t. So we just saw why Euler's method works, and it's simply because it's based on the equation of the tangent line, which we already know is a method that we can use to approximate the value of a function near the point of tangency. So when can we not use Euler's method? When does Euler's method fail such that we're unable to use it to find an approximation for our differential equation? Well, there's one very specific instance when Euler's method will fail, when it won't work and you will not be able to apply it. And that is when the function f, which is the value over here on the right-hand side, of the differential equation is either not continuous, it's not defined, or its derivative with respect to y is not defined. So for example, with this function f of ty, we have basically here f of ty is equal to 2 plus y. Well, 2 plus y is a simple polynomial function. There's nothing about this that will make it undefined or make it not continuous. So the function itself, f, is defined and continuous. And then its derivative with respect to y, so we could say f sub y, or the derivative with respect to y, will be equal to, the derivative of 2 is 0, because the derivative of any constant is 0, and the derivative of y will just be 1. So we get the derivative of the function f with respect to y is just 1. Well, we also have no problem here with this derivative. There's nothing about this that makes it undefined or not continuous. So because these two functions, because these two right-hand sides are okay, we know that we're going to be able to use Euler's method to find an approximate solution for this differential equation. But let's pretend instead that we had a different example. So instead of y prime is equal to 2 plus y, let's say we had something like y prime is equal to y to the one-third power. Well, we could rewrite that as the third root of y, and there's not necessarily any value of y that makes this undefined or not continuous. If we put a negative value in here for y, we can still take the third root of a negative value. If we were trying to take the square root of a negative value, that'd be a different story, but here there's not really anything that makes this undefined. But when we take the derivative of y to the one-third with respect to y, taking the derivative of y to the one-third gives us one-third y to the negative two-thirds power when we use power rule. Well, if we rewrite that, we make the exponent positive by moving y to the negative two-thirds to the denominator. And so we end up with one over three y to the positive two-thirds. Well, now we have a problem. 
because we have y in our denominator. And if I were to plug in y equals zero, I would end up with zero in my denominator. I'd have one over zero. And as you know, I can't have zero in the denominator. It would make the function f sub y undefined. It would break the function. And I can't have that. So the original function y prime or the original function f of ty, that one was okay. But the derivative function f sub y gave me one particular point, y equals zero, where that function was undefined. So in that case, I know I'm not going to be able to apply Euler's method if I'm starting with y prime is equal to y to the one third. So that's when Euler's method will fail. That's when it's not going to work. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the accuracy of Euler's method, including when Euler's method will underestimate the actual solution, when it will overestimate the actual solution, and how accurate in general the estimate's going to be. Now, in general, the underestimation overestimation question is a pretty simple one. If your solution curve is concave up, like this one, then Euler's method is going to underestimate the actual value. And that's because this looks like the picture we drew earlier. So we always want to start our tangent line from this initial point right here, and the tangent might look something like this. So when that's the case, you might be trying to find an approximation for the solution at, let's say, this point, which is t sub 1. Well, the corresponding point t sub 1 along the tangent line is right here. So obviously, the tangent line value here is going to be less than, it's lower than the actual value right here. The same value of t, but because the curve is concave up, because the solution is concave up, it's going to have a value that is above or higher than the value along the tangent line. Contrast that with a curve that's concave down, a solution curve that's concave down, and your tangent line might look something maybe like this. And in that case, you might be trying to find the value of t sub 1 right here. Well, along your tangent line, that value would be right here. So the value you find, let's say this has a value of 10, this is going to have a value of, let's say, 8. It is lower than this point right here along the tangent line. So when the curve's concave down, the approximation that you find using the tangent line or using Euler's method formula is going to be an overestimate of the actual value along the solution curve. So that's one thing to be aware of if you have a graph or if you know the shape of the solution curve. If it's concave up, you know and can expect that your approximation will be less than the actual value. If your curve's concave down, you can expect that your approximation will be greater than the actual value. Now, how can you tell how accurate your Euler's method approximation actually is. For example, here, maybe the actual value along the solution curve is 8, but the value using the Euler's method approximation was 10. In this case, you're off by 25%. So Euler's method is actually a terrible approximation, which tells you that this curve is probably changing very quickly. So how do you find that error estimation? How do you calculate error? Well, at a basic level, what we say is error is equal to, we always take the exact value. So like in this example, it was 8, and this is going to be an absolute value. So 8, and then we subtract the approximated value. So here we just said that the approximated value was 10. And then we divide that by the actual value. So again, the actual value was 8. And so we get 8 minus 10 is a negative 2. But then we take the absolute value of that, and the absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. So this comes out to positive 2 over 8, which is, of course, 1 fourth, or 0.25. And then we multiply this last value here by 100%. So 0.25 times 100% gives us here 25% as the error for this particular approximation. Normally, though, when we use Euler's method, remember that we just come up with this approximated value here of 10. This Euler's method approximation process 
gives us the value here of 10, we don't normally have the value of 8. Well, if you're asked to find the error in your Euler's method approximation, what that means is that you're probably going to be able to use calculus to find the exact solution to your Euler's method problem. So it's a little bit backwards because if you can find the exact solution using either the separable differential equations, exact differential equations, or linear differential equations method, then why would you ever use Euler's method to approximate a solution when you can find an exact one? Well, the point is we want you to understand Euler's method, know what it means, be able to apply it, and use it when you have to. But when you have to find the error, you can't know how much you're off by with your error unless you have the exact value. So that's why they usually give you a problem that you can solve using separable exact or linear differential equation method. So for example, this problem in particular, y prime equals 2 plus y, if I rewrite this as y prime minus y equals 2, what I find is that this is in the exact format of a linear differential equation. So this is a linear differential equation, and I can use the method of linear differential equations to find an exact solution to this differential equation. So when you're asked to find error, you want to look at the differential equation you were given and determine is it separable, exact, or linear. In this case, it's linear. So then I go through that process and I find a general solution to that linear differential equation in the form y of t equals, and then I'll have a function and I'll end up with a constant of integration over here plus c. To find that value for c, I'm going to plug in my initial condition. In this problem here, it was y of 0 equals 0. So I'm going to plug that in and apply that. That will allow me to solve for a value of c. And then I'll truly have a particular solution, y of t, for the differential equation. Then once I have that solution, I have the value plugged in for c, that's when I want to go over here to y of 3, plug in 3 for t, and get the exact solution which will give me the value or the solution on the solution curve itself. So it would give me this value here, or it would give me this value here, the curve on the solution itself. That is the exact value. So that's how you find exact value. And from the Euler's method process, I already found the approximated value. So with the approximated and exact value, then you can plug into your error formula, which again is error is equal to absolute value of exact minus approximate all divided by exact. And you calculate then a value, multiply that by 100%, and that will tell you the error of your approximation. And usually you're going to come up with something much, much smaller than 25%, usually a couple percentage points or less. And you'll be able to say that your error is something like two and a half percent or a one percent or a half a percent error, which tells you that the Euler's method approximation was actually pretty accurate and actually pretty close to the exact value of the differential equation. I hope that video helped you, and if it did, hit that like button, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.